of sorts and This is Delmar Larson. I'm the executive director and founder of the LibreTex Project. I'm also a professor of chemistry at the University of California, David Davis. Uh, Yassine uh, is uh, my co-presenter uh, and uh, the master behind all the technical details uh, be, uh, in Project Solo. Uh, he's the senior project uh, manager. Uh, he's also a CEO of uh, Learnful. Um, Learnful Inc. I'm not sure what's after Learnful, if it's just Learnful. Um, Learnful just, Labs Inc. Yeah. Learnful oh, Labs Inc. Learnful.io. Uh, 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 there you go. Thank you. Sorry about that uh, uh, and such. But anyways, let's get uh, going here. So I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of some of the things that we've talked about. But begin first, I want to talk about how happy we are that we are 14 years old. Um, so it was last week that we had, last week, 14 years ago, that is, that we had the very first save in the very first wiki um, that constituted the, what is now the LibreTex project. Then it was called the Chem Wiki uh, because I was a professor of chemistry. I was particularly interested in targeting chemistry, uh, OER. Uh, and it was born out of a need in order to address uh, costs because a lot of my students were not uh, purchasing the textbooks in my classes, and that was a particularly detrimental thing. Um, however, there are many other aspects that one could pursue OER, and uh, that has been dis discussed, no doubt, in many other presentations uh, in this week. Um, so let's start uh, with what I start all my presentations, which, which is the mission statement of the LibreTex project. We're implementing a community-built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. And each of these uh, bolded uh, uh, words, the three C's, are exceedingly important in order to dictate who we are and why we, uh, why we operate, uh, how we do. The first one is community. Uh, it's important. Uh, it, it, OER, by definition, is a community-based uh, entity. It's designed in order to... Um, actually, hold on one second here. I want to uh, make the uh, scene... Actually, Jen Okay, now you guys can see it? Yes. Okay, so uh, fine. Uh, let me start <laughs> again from this beginning um, before we have any other uh, genitalia uh, come on uh, top of our screen. So we're implementing a community-built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. Uh, OER uh, operates as a community uh, where you create uh, resources and then you share those resources, the five R's underlying the, uh, as the constitution underlying OER. And so that means that what we're building is a community built, uh, a community used uh, uh, resource. And that includes everybody uh, that's uh, at this meeting um, that is not drawing nasty things on the screen. Uh, OER can be defined in a variety of different ways. Although, like I mentioned, there are core principles behind OER. Uh, and I'm going to, for the sake of this conversation, just uh, call it free textbooks or freely available textbooks. And if you want to talk about subtle details behind that, we can do so after the presentation. It's comprehensive in that we follow a no gap left behind policy. So while uh, our project was uh, uh, implemented out of a chemistry-based project, uh, we've expanded in the 15 or 14 years since we started uh, to essentially cover uh, every field in academia uh, uh, that's horizontally and also uh, at, at different levels from kindergarten all the way up to uh, graduate level. So we're both vertically and, and horizontally uh, expansive uh, and we consider no gap uh, to be left behind. So if something needs to be filled and there are lots of things that need to be filled, we're very excited in order to work on doing so. Uh, similarly, we follow a no tech left behind policy. So as emerging technologies become available, typically uh, OER or openly licensed uh, or open source, that is, uh, we capitalize on them, uh, bring them into uh, our Libreverse, uh, and then provide it as a set of resources for other people to capitalize on uh, for their OER needs. And lastly, <clears throat> the content that we create uh, and we host uh, has to be curatable, that is livable, living, gives us the ability in order to take stuff and update them uh, and uh, in ensure that they have the flexibility in order to be able to address uh, changing standards of um, accessibility or DEI or other things like that, uh, that static or dead libraries like a pile of PDFs have a difficult time in order to be able to address. Um, so what is the LibreText? Uh, well, there are 
three primary mechanisms in order to look at the LibreText project. One is as a construction platform, uh, that's primarily through authors. One is a dissemination platform, uh, which could be through authors or it could be uh, from uh, people who've con constructed stuff off of our site and use the LibreText off of that. Um, and they can be also used or viewed as a learning platform, which is a more student uh, view uh, that has a variety of components in terms of being able to guide the pedagogy of what we're dealing with here. I'm not going to be discussing um, these uh, in particular, um, but I want to focus on what the LibreText project is right now. And the LibreText project um, is tied together into what we refer to as the Libreverse. And the Libreverse consists of multiple uh, uh, instances um, based on underlying technologies that change from one instance to another instance typically uh, in order to be able to provide a massive infrastructure that's very powerful for people to be able to use them. Um, the core of that are our living libraries, which consists of 14 interconnected but independently operating wiki-like uh, technologies. Um, these are operated out of a company down in San Diego called CX1. Uh, and then we have these ancillary technologies meant in order to advance beyond just a traditional text-based version or text and image-based version of a textbook into the future. In other words, next generation textbook. And then includes things like the homework system, our ADAPT system, which I've discussed multiple times this week, uh, Project Solo that we're going to be talking about um, in a few moments, uh, Jupyter Notebook system lets us embed executable code into our textbook, uh, uh, servers designed in order to keep uh, JavaScript code so we can add actually tap into and utilize more advanced features than what, again, text and images provide. Learning analytics uh, uh, for guiding uh, instructors of record in order to evaluate their pedagogy uh, when they're using uh, OER or even to evaluate the efficacy of the OER resource. Bot server in order to be able to curate the content collectively. A comments and conductor, which is an interface in order to, uh, on the front end, search through the infrastructure that we have. And on the back end, as an organizing tool in order to facilitate the construction of OER, either by individuals or by teams in order to be able to move forward. And we do have videos on ADAPT and Commons and Conductor, uh, and even uh, these other aspects were mentioned in uh, previous videos uh, here, including, then again, the forums, which are meant in order to facilitate a communication uh, off of here. Now, a key aspect behind how we operate uh, is a centralization. These things are entities that we run or technologies that we operate within our infrastructure. It's centralized, it's open access, if not open source. In fact, everything is open source with the exception of some of the core technologies underlying the libraries. Uh, and you can access them or you will be able to access them via various uh, GitHub repositories uh, via simple searches and such that offer of there. But the key aspect here is that this is a centralized approach. And there are benefits and detractions for a centralized approach. Uh, let me skip over that. But I want before I go into it, I want to just talk about one of the key components that we get off of here. By having a centralized infrastructure, we provide a one-stop shopping experience of sorts for uh, OER users, whether they happen to be authors, distributors, or, or students, that you know where to go to in order to find your resource. And this is one of the problems that I believe that the OER community has faced for a long time as it and has even gotten more complicated in the last few years. By bringing everything together into a central infrastructure, provide, made the LibreText project as the largest and most popular online repository of OER textbook material on the internet today. We've delivered close to 800 million page views uh, um, in the 14 years of our existence. Um, and uh, uh, on average, we deliver about 750,000 page views a day. And that's an immense amount of activity for a single set of uh, servers in order to be able to address, uh, but we're committed in order to be able to pursue the success off of that. We have close to a half a million pages of OER content uh, on our repository distributed roughly equally between what we call centrally curated textbooks uh, in our central bookshelves and campus curated content in their uh, campus bookshelves. So it has a little bit of flexibility and uh, stability off of here that we, uh, we develop. And as you can see, we've been uh, uh, growing uh, fairly pseudo exponentially uh, since we started back in 2008. Uh, that's out there. So let me talk about why we do these things. Now I'm getting a little bit on my soapbox here. So uh, please bear with me for a little bit and you can understand why we do what we do and why we are implementing this, the project solo. So uh, 
the OER universe is fragmented. Um, so the opposite of a centralized approach would be decentralized. And when things are decentralized with no communication infrastructure from one instance to another instance, I refer to that as being fragmented. Uh, and fragmentation is, an, is a serious problem in any sort of field trying to move forward. Um, for example, if you're trying to find OER content out there, you can find links to OER content in the Open Textbook Library. It's a referatory, so it doesn't actually hold content out there, but it tells you where to go find content. OER Com Commons does have an authoring capability, but most of its utility is in terms of also being a similar referatory out there. OpenStax uh, is, uh, holds its own content. Uh, uh, Merlot uh, is a mixture of referatory and repository. Open SUNY has content, Galileo, Open Oregon, NOBA, BC Campus, eCampus Ontario, Alberta, uh, Sailor, uh, California State University, uh, um, individual campuses like Oregon State University, and many, many, many other campuses have OER content. <coughs> now, some people consider this to be really a good idea. Uh, things are distributed across different spots. Uh, they're able to embrace and grow off of it. And there are some benefits associated with that, but there's some key distractions or, or, or uh, negatives associated with that. And for example, let's say you have 10 different copies of the same book distributed in 10 of these different repositories or links to repositories out there. And you need to update the content on one of the books because you improve it. Because OER needs lots of editing. It still does, uh, and it will for a very long period of time. So when you upgrade one chapter in one uh, campus has updated, another campus uh, does another chapter, another campus does another chapter, and if you have no mechanism to bring them all together, if it's a fragmented infrastructure that hosts these contents, then what happens when a new person comes in or a new campus and they want to adopt that book? There's no mechanism to take the benefits off of these things, no versioning capabilities in order to be able to pull it together so that you can get the most advanced feature off of there. And I consider this a major detriment in terms of moving things forward because we're doing one step forward, two steps back, actually more specifically, two steps forward, one step back here in order to try to make things uh, in, operate in a coherent manner moving forward. And I believe that that is a detriment uh, to the community. So there are different ways in order to address these sort of issues. So the first thing I want to mention is that in viewing OER, um, it, it, I like to view OER from a conflict theory sort of approach here, and Veronica can step up and if she feels I'm not using the terminology properly, um, in that we are trying to provide an alternative to a commercial infrastructure. Uh, a traditional based approach that's been used in academia for many, many decades uh, out there. And there are different ways in order to do that. So if you have lots of different uh, fish in the sea that are doing each of their little OER project, uh, it's all heavily fragmented. If you want to compete against the big guys, and the publishers that have uh, lots of money and have been working on this uh, infrastructure for a long period of time, um, the one right way is to get everybody organized. Uh, you work to take that fragmentation, uh, fragmented infrastructure and make things work in a concerted manner. Now, anyone in academia and anyone who's worked with faculty in academia knows that herding cats is the best description to describe faculty. So herding all these projects in order to work together in a concerted manner is a particularly difficult, if not impossible, procedure in order to do. So what do we do? Well, I don't want to give up. So what we want to do is we build a bigger fish, centralize everything where we have control over it, we curate it. And I should be specific, when we use the term centralization, we're taking advantage of the O in OER, the openness and the sharing capabilities in order to bring it together. By bringing it into a central warehouse, we have the ability in order to make a bigger fish in order to compete mano y mano with the, um, uh, with the big publishers uh, out there. Uh, but that's a centralized approach versus a decentralized approach like this, um, which is not doing it. The community is not there, uh, off of there. So in... In the effort in order to pursue this, we have a significant part of our, uh, our infrastructure is designed around what we refer to as harvesting. And harvesting is the procedure that consists of taking an external OER uh, uh, resource, the R resource, that wasn't created on our infrastructure and integrating it into our platform uh, then going through and editing it, standardizing it, so it has the underlying infrastructure in order to play well within our infrastructure. Uh, that is convenient because then if you want to be able to, uh, to remix a book, that is, 
use content from different sources, it's already standardized, it's already ready to go for you to copy, paste, and ready to rock. Anyone who's ever tried to copy from a PDF understands the limitations of having content distributed in different formats. If you have, let's for example, uh, content in LaTeX, content, uh, handwritten content in press books, content on a website, and a wide range of other formats out there, Google Docs, PDFs, whatever, it's, it, it's, it's significantly hindering the ability in order to remix that content and move it forward, irrespective of curating that content so that everyone benefits when you move the advancement forward off of that. That is the benefit of a centralized infrastructure and that's why we pursued that instead of a decentralized, uh, fragmented approach, because the community needs this. Now, not everyone believes that or agrees with me in the community, but this is our belief, and this is how we've actually been moving forward uh, with our development. So essentially, when we harvest OER content, again, capitalizing on the O and the whole point of OER, we're creating a bigger bucket of Legos for communities in order to take and be able to put them together and construct uh, your vision out there without having to have bits and pieces of Lego blocks with Duplos, with Lincoln logs, uh, with range of, uh, uh, of other things that just don't interact very well together uh, off of that. So we're centralized, we're standardized, it provides an interconverted infrastructure. You can start to use that to build collections, aka textbooks, although you can build collections around things that wouldn't be considered a textbook, for example, the collections of labs or visualizations, or because we have a homework infrastructure of H5P exercises or other things that are important for uh, operation. It provides infinite flexibility, just like anyone who's played with Legos can build wide range of different things, and it's curatable. So you can update the content and then everyone benefits. Now, I know that's the third time I've mentioned it, but it's a key benefit from a centralization that you don't get from a decentralized approach. Um, so you can look at trying to build an infrastructure off here, and this is how we look at it, that you have a centralized platform and a decentralized platform. And this is one of the issues I have with uh, people talking about this in the community, is that both of these approaches has pros and cons. So anyone that just focuses on the negatives of one versus the other, either doesn't understand uh, the complexities behind these things or chooses not to understand the complexities behind these things. So the centralization provides the ability of high stabilization, high fidelity. Uh, it, it does lack local control, which could be good or bad, depending upon uh, the local individuals. It is effective in community sharing uh, because by definition, it's centralized. It pools the resources uh, and it's efficient off of that. The decentralized platform in, uh, gives uh, uh, significantly larger flexibility in principle, although you can work around that, but it does generate a fragmented ecosystem. Uh, uh, it requires independent resources, uh, uh, and it's generally inefficient. However, some people believe the flexibility outweighs the inefficiency uh, as it operates. Another way in order to look at this approach is, is, from, this, the, uh, is from a network approach. Uh, so if you were to take a view uh, of a centralized infrastructure where people capitalize or, or take advantage of the infrastructure, uh, <clears throat> this right here uh, doesn't scale very well because you, const uh, you constantly have to increase the, the magnitude of uh, the centralized infrastructure. Um, it is a single point of failure. Now, a single point of failure is a common argument against the centralized infrastructure, but it's only really applicable uh, in, the, in the case where everything is stored on that single source. But the open infrastructure has content distributed in a variety of different places. So therefore, this point of failure argument is largely moot within the OER infrastructure uh, out there. An alternative, uh, if you're able to make a fragmented infrastructure that is networked, so things can communicate with each other, you can handle that curation aspect if you do it right, um, uh, but you don't have uh, the issues associated with the centralization. It scales well, uh, it, it has uh, reduced centralized resources. It's a more robust network. This is one of the reasons why the internet was created in order to establish constant or multiple flows from one source to another source. And what we're trying to do in constructing our, our expanded LibreNet, which is our consortium infrastructure, is building a network that reflects a little bit of centralization and a little bit of decentralization that's out there. Now, that's for our consortium membership. That's for the people who have, uh, that, that take advantage of our centralized, existing centralized infrastructure off of that. Um, let me skip over that. Uh, and go into where Solo comes in with this bigger picture of things. Um, so I'm getting off my soapbox uh, and I'm starting to explain uh, where we're going here. 
not everybody is uh, in the in the OER community or even in the greater world is 100% behind a centralized approach of doing things. Um, and this can hinder uh, the impact that we have as a project in order to be able to distribute the resources and distribute the technologies that we have established to the greater uh, pool. One of the efforts that we are starting to implement as part of our global impact, and I will mention that 55% of our traffic is actually outside the United States, so I already have a global impact, mostly in uh, the former Commonwealth where English is the lingua franca or the official language uh, of the country. So we want to be able to expand into other countries, especially uh, in developing countries or countries that have very large at need uh, populations, and more specifically to address uh, countries that English is not the primary language. Uh, and we started to play a little bit a, a while ago into uh, what is referred to as uh, real-time machine translation. Um, and uh, this is a snapshot of this infrastructure that we, we took down uh, in order to modify some things that gives us the ability to take the content on a page. And before you read it, you could push it into uh, Amazon Machine Translator. So if you're unfamiliar with Machine Translator, think of it as a um, as an AI of sorts, not really an AI. It's, it's, it's more of a machine learning that's able to do a machine translation, hence the term, of your content into another language. Uh, and the more training that uh, that translator has, the better it is. And things have evolved a lot in the last decade in machine translation. And there's going to continue to evolve uh, out there. But by coupling to Amazon uh, machine translation infrastructure, we had 81 different languages that you can switch to from English into and then be able to read. And these are examples, again, of Korean, uh, Chinese, and um, uh, Italian, I think. Pretty sure that's Italian. Uh, <clears throat> that's out there. Now, this was really great. Um, it provided real time translation uh, that you can get to. And we were very excited about this for several things. Uh, first, we wanted to use this not just as real time, but as a mechanism to take our repository, our half a million pages of OER content, and funnel it into the machine translation to generate a half a million pages of a new language in OER. And that is really cool uh, because there are many languages out there that don't have much OER at all. Uh, and now we can make this massive repository that we've kept together, standardized, organized, and then pipe it in. And the only issue that we have here is A, it costs a bit of money in order to do the machine translation and it takes a bit of time, multiple days in order to process uh, this, this stuff. Now that's about 95 it's like 90% imperfect, or let me say 90% of an imperfect translation because it's machine. But that's much better than 0% perfect translation, where you have a human that goes through that uh, in order to review this. But we can use this as a mechanism in order to facilitate human translation, where you start and you do as much translation as you can with machine, and then human can come in, a subject matter expert, for example, in that tongue, and can start to improve the translation uh, on the fly. And because we have a wiki technology, which is arguably the best technology for implementing large scale collaborative construction efforts, think of Wikipedia, this thing is well designed, uh, our infrastructure, in order to be able to scale this thing up. With appropriate support, we can make millions and millions of pages of OER for the world. Uh, you know, with just some calculations in order to move forward and move things uh, forward off of that. So this, we're still moving forward quickly. We're particularly excited in order to be able to do this in Ukrainian because there are lots of Ukrainian students that are displaced right now and need access to their textbooks that they did not bring with them for obvious reasons due to the, the war in, in, in Russia. I mean, sorry, in Ukraine. I, that was not meant there was no intention off of that. Um, and, and so we're very excited in order to be able to pursue that. But we also have an Espanol library that we've already been building for a while as a test case for that, uh, because that's the language that's more applicable or, or more useful in America than Ukrainian. But we want to do both simultaneously. So fine. This is our goal. This is our interest. We know that this is, a, this is important. We have uh, the just a few books that we have on the Spanish. Our Espanol library has collected uh, several million pages 
page views so far. If we were to scale it up instead of a few thousand pages to a half a million pages, it will have a major impact in the world, hands down. We just need the resources in order to do that because the current funding comes from the Department of Education, California Education, from the state of California, and neither of them uh, have a global uh, uh, mission in the grants that we have received. Now, why is this connected to SOLO? And why am I bringing it together? Well, <clears throat> uh, recently, uh, UNESCO uh, formulated a, a, a program, an infrastructure, in order to pursue OER uh, in the world. Um, many campuses, let me rephrase that, many countries have a requirement uh, that, uh, that OER has to be hosted on open source technology. Uh, before they can do that. So in that case there, our centralized approach, operating via open access technology, although not open source with the core libraries, although we could switch it over, but it's silly to do that because our current uh, partnership with, uh, with NICE CX1, it really provides a, a beautiful infrastructure for moving this thing forward. But we need to be able to move uh, or come up with a different solution in order to be able to reach into these uh, countries that really would benefit from our uh, repository. In order to do that, we started to implement what we could refer to as Project Solo. And Project Solo is designed in order to make a standalone uh, version of the Libre text or the Libreverse infrastructure. It doesn't contain all the infrastructure around it because that would be very difficult in order to be able to replicate in a single application to be able to distribute, but build something around or build an application around Drupal, the technology that underlies the uh, studio um, that we use for hosting our H5P, which is a, intrinsically a content management system. Uh, and that could be designed in order to be able to host our content, whether they're in English or any other language that we have, and essentially build this infrastructure that instead of individual campuses that are part of our LibreNet consortium, now they're individual countries with multiple campuses that are part of the Soloverse, a network in which you can access and people can store content in, uh, in various sources that can communicate with each other and collectively move forward behind that using open source technology. Now, the key point off of this thing is that we will still be operating as a central curator of our content. We believe that's critical in order to be able to move things forward. However, individual campuses can expand beyond what we've established and tap into, or will be able to tap into our central corpus in order to pull into. So a campus at another, uh, another country can basically uh, download the software, install it uh, appropriately, and then get automatic access to a half a million pages of OER content. And they're ready to rock and move forward. And if they need it to be translated before they download it, we can go about doing that if we get the appropriate infrastructure in place for doing that. And that's what uh, Solo is designed for doing. There are lots of features associated with Solo that I'm not going to talk about because I presume Yasin is going to talk about that. But we're very excited off of this prospect, and we hope to be able to get this thing out soon because this is going to greatly impact, uh, increase the impact of the Libre text infrastructure uh, and how we've been pursuing things so far to the greater um, to the greater world uh, and to anyone who has a pet peeve about open access but closed source can. Uh, can adopt a, an open source technology off of that. Uh, and we'll eventually also be able to maintain it for individual people as software as a service, although um, that would have the same functionality as open source, as, uh, as our, as, uh, our, um, our centralized infrastructure for all practical purposes. Okay, so with that, uh, I will end with what I started, which is our mission uh, state mission statement, and then I'll let Yasin go into an overview of what he's been doing. We're implementing a community built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. And Project Soda is going to make it so that platform is then distributed across multiple individual sites, not just maintained in the central infrastructure off of there. There's lots of stuff for us to do, but we're very excited about that, and I hope that you uh, share in our enthusiasm off of that. Um, with that, I will step away uh, and let Yasin do uh, these issues. I'm not sure if there's some questions uh, in the chat that need to be addressed. Um, uh, no questions. Great. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, machine translation has been quickly improving. I'd like to improve a lot more. Yeah, true. How would you update the model? Re so this is a, a good a, a good question. So the, 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 um. I don't take the stance that we should 
not do this because it's going to get better later on. I think that that's not entirely the best way in doing it. Um, the the estimation in order to be able so the current half a million pages and back of the envelope calculation using Amazon's uh, infra, uh, infrastructure at uh, cost uh, or at their cost at their at, uh, at their price point it would be about thirty thousand dollars per language. Now our corpus is growing quite rapidly. So that will also increase as we go off of here. Um, but that's a price point that we, we have to operate with. Uh, so in some cases, uh, the, the, intent that, the intent that we I want to do is to say, okay, I'm gonna focus on Spanish first. Uh, we're gonna take these things, pull it into Spanish, pull it to machine translation, do this process, bring it back down to our Espanol library, and then go to people in order to uh, help update the content uh, accordingly. So you need a human in order to be able to do so. Um, I don't wanna download them uh, all at once. I wanna try to establish an infrastructure that's going on that, but we can evaluate whether it's worthwhile in order to go back and re-download it, which of course would require additional support in order to do so, uh, or there's some other mechanisms out there. But as you mentioned, uh, there are other providers uh, in order to provide Amazon, uh, provide these languages. And Amazon has 81 languages, but there are many other languages. Uh, some of them refer to as uh, low resource languages, ones that where the neural uh, network is not well established, uh, that will be growing and that you can capitalize on it. For example, uh, we were having a a discussion in South Africa for Zulu and Sotho. Uh, and we only found one, we, Amazon doesn't handle either of those things. Pretty sure it doesn't have other things. And we needed to go to one that was in Cyprus uh, that handles. So there's a range of other ones and there's really some beautiful translation stuff in, uh, in Germany and things like that. So we needed to uh, go around and identify what uh, technologies are available. Uh, and then obviously they're gonna be changing. So we gotta keep it flexible uh, in order to find out which one's the best one or which one is able to provide the best price point or potent potentially comp this because this is an altruistic uh, effort off of that. Um, so, uh, and as you say, it's easy to retranslate e effort. Once you get humans involved in it, that's where the complication comes in because you can't just take the content and re uh, retranslate it. You'll have to believe that the human does a better job of any machine translation uh, by definition. Um, so there's gonna be a little bit of trade-off of that, but this is not terribly dissimilar from OER in general when you're curating it. Uh, it's like you're editing content and then someone creates a new edition off of our site. You gotta somehow integrate this into a new edition and work with it off of there. These things are relatively straightforward in order to be able to do that. We just need to, uh, and, and, and the infrastructure is in place, it's fairly straightforward in order to do so. It's just basically a little bit of uh, regular expression manipulations and things like that in order to pipe, uh, pipe it through and such like that. I'm really excited about this. I, I think this is great. I think this is what's necessary. Uh, and I think we have the ideal technology uh, in order to be able to pursue this. Uh, so I will end uh, uh, with that and I'll let Yasin uh, move forward uh, and uh, you guys can see a little bit of what we've been doing or maybe a lot depending upon uh, how much Yasin wants to uh, to show. Every time I ask for a lot, he tells me uh, I have to expect a little, but we will see. So yeah, so just before I get into it, uh, if there's any other questions for Delmar, I know there was a lot that we talked about just there. Uh, feel free to throw into the chat or to just turn on your mic. Give it a couple seconds while I get set up here. So feel free to. So Doug, you mentioned uh, uh, you had to link to several things that work with Drupal. I'm not entirely sure uh, if that uh, where Drupal fits in with. Uh... Oh, is this a localized machine translation that you can download uh, in not a not an API? No, it just uh, I I just was I just ran across it the other day. It just it just has a it just has a nice list of some different third party providers that can yeah. do translation beyond Amazon, uh, in case it's useful to anyone. Um, it I is. I mean, so there, there, there's there, there's some evidence that there are other uh, that other technology that other people's technologies are better than Amazon, especially in certain languages uh, that are out there. Uh, and I and the low resource languages uh, have lots of flexibility and lots of needs for improvement, especially when you're dealing with sciences, when there just aren't words for many scientific terms uh, that you can translate. And there, uh, I've even encountered several different projects designed in order to try to address that and decolonize 
decolonialize their uh, their language uh, and bring it back into uh, service. The same thing also applies for not just uh, external to North America, but there's uh, an effort in uh, Canada, uh, and there there is to a lesser extent than in America uh, for uh, addressing indigenous uh, Native American or First Nation uh, languages in order to uh, start to reflect that as a valid um, environment in order to move forward off of that. Anyways, I, I, will, I will hand it off to Yasin and uh, we can certainly have a greater discussion of this afterwards. So. Cool. All right. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is a little bit of a design demo, if you will, design prototype. I uh, might even do a tech demo if the uh, if the tech gods allow us, but uh, we will see how it goes. Um, so when you install Solo, which is again it's open source, it's, uh, built on Drupal, another open source project, uh, on your own servers, you'll have something like this on the home page where uh, you'll be able to see courses, a bookshelf, H5P library, quiz bank, and so on. Uh, as Delmar mentioned, we have an enormous amount of resources that uh, we're going to actually make available uh, in each solo instance, if you would like. So for instance, we might have some courses already put together, courses like what is OER, introduction to Creative Commons licenses, things like that, the kind of generic uh, courses that uh, might you know, be a part of your install. Uh, same goes with the bookshelf. Like the, the idea here is that when you install solo on your own instance, you're going to have access to uh, the translated books or uh, essentially whatever books we can have available uh, in this format. Uh, and of course, the entire idea is that uh, within uh, this in, uh, infrastructure, your instructors, your, your designers, they'll be able to create courses, books, uh, H5P, a quiz bank, and so on and so forth. Uh, so here we're looking at courses, uh, you know, let's say this is the course that me, myself as a student, I'm interested in taking. Uh, and when we say course, uh, just one, one thing real quick, um, uh, don't think LMS, think more something along the lines of a course on LinkedIn learning or course in, uh, in Coursera or something like that. Uh, so this is the course that I'm interested in. I'm going to click on that. As a student that's not a part of this course yet, this is what I would see. I would see uh, you know, the, the outline of the course, any announcements from the instructor, an overview, any other sort of metadata, including licensing. Uh, my first step as a student would be to essentially enroll into this course. Once enrolled, this is kind of what I would expect. Uh, you know, it's very similar to any sort of textbook authoring or content management authoring uh, platform. I would have my outline or my navigation on the left-hand side, my content uh, on the other side here. Uh, what we can do within the Drupal infrastructure uh, is within the course itself, we'll be able to uh, provide the student a you know indication of what content they've already read, what content they're currently reading. So there is some sort of tracking there. Um, You'll notice that you know something like a check mark and something like a, an arrow pointing at where I am and where where I've already kind of done the reading. Uh, some important things to outline here. Number one, um, you know what we're looking at here in terms of the actual content. It's a it's let's call it a, a book page or a, or a book or what have you. Uh, very similar to any other sort of place where you might create a page, uh, a web page, if you will. Uh, you know, you can have text, images, media, video, H5P. Uh, there's a number of other sort of uh, tools and services and, and technologies that we make use of at LibreText, such as, uh, you know, some 3D modeling, uh, Jupyter notebooks. So these are the sort of tools that will eventually be there. But out of the box, we're going to have things like text, media, images, and H5P quizzes and so on. Uh, we'll be using, uh, for, for technical reasons, uh, to, to get more into the technical aspects of how a page is built. We'll be using CK Editor version 5, the latest version of CK Editor. We'll also have Gutenberg available as a drag and drop kind of page builder for, for instructors who want that experience. Uh, more importantly, number two here, we're going to have a course outline that's not just books, right? So remember, we're talking about a course, uh, we're using the word course, uh, but what we're talking about is a book but we're basically saying it's a book with LMS-esque features, right? Things like 
uh, you know, not just a bunch of chapters and, you know, pages within those chapters, but a book, a course outline can include, you know, obviously chapters or quizzes or H5P or, or polls or a discussion forum uh, or forms and surveys and things of that nature. Uh, so uh, what my course outline includes, and we can see some icons here. In this case, we have a chapter, uh, which could be a chapter that I've written. So remember the first page that we had there, the homepage, we can go into books and we can see all the different books that were there. So it's, it's either a, a chapter I've written or a chapter I've sourced for, excuse me, from any of the books that are available. I can also, in this case, I've included a poll. So it's, this is just like a, a survey of sorts, uh, a live poll for my students. After that poll, once they see the poll, they see another chapter, follow that by a quiz. If you can see where my cursor is here. Uh, so that's, that's how you would essentially, that's how a course outline might uh, work. And that's how it's different from a typical book. We're not just doing chapters and pages, we're doing interactive elements or, or uh, I don't know what to call them. They're more like activities, if you will, within the book itself. Uh, and just really quickly, other features that we're gonna have in here that's not demonstrated in this, uh, in this design, we'll have san uh, social annotation via hypothesis. Uh, there'll be a comments and discussion section on each page. So students who want to have a comment can, can post it there. Each page, each chapter will be exportable as a PDF and as HTML. Uh, there'll be a feedback form. Imagine, you know, let's say three emojis, smiley face, uh, a frowny face and a question mark, uh, you know, get that initial kind of feedback on the page uh, from your students. Uh, remixable at a page and chapter level. So as an instructor, I'll be able to see a book or a chapter or a page and immediately create a copy of that page in that state of time and uh, basically take that copy and do with it what I would like to do with it. Re uh, remix it, edit it for my own context. Uh, so let's take a, so here we have a panel where we're looking at how a course outline or how a course is going to be put together. Our course is still this AC electrical circuits course. You can see here in our course outline, we have a book chapter. Uh, the chapter is fundamentals from the book AC electrical circuits. Uh, there's the license for that book chapter. There's the author of that book chapter. Uh, after that, we can see uh, we have a poll. Uh, what is your favorite graphing tool? After that, another book chapter. That's the name of the chapter. That's the book it's from. Then we have a quiz. That's the name of the quiz. Uh, and then we have another chapter. And so uh, below that, we can see that we can continue adding to our outline. We can add more chapters, more quizzes, polls, surveys, forms, and discussions. Uh, we also see information about, you know, uh, is, this, uh, is this element, is this object in our course outline enabled? If it is enabled, it means that uh, students are going to be using it. Uh, then you know, uh, you know that's what that tag essentially means. Is it visible in the outline? You know, if it's enabled but it's still hidden, maybe I don't want want this specific curriculum or this cohort, I should say, uh, using this chapter. I can hide it if I'd like. Um, is completion required or not required? So, uh, do I want students to be able to? Uh, complete their readings without reading this one specific object or, or activity? Is it, skip, is it skippable? Do, do, does a student need to finish reading this chapter before going to this poll or any other sort of object, sort of uh, stop gaps, if you will? Um, so this is essentially how a course outline will be built. Um, you can see it's, 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 it's Lego pieces, right? It's book chapters from books that you know, will be pre-populated via LibreText corp uh, enormous corpus uh, or by books that your faculty themselves, your designers themselves are creating. And I can just source or a book that I've created published within Solo itself. Uh, and the same goes for polls. Again, that could be sourced or it could be a poll that I create. The same goes for quizzes. Quizzes themselves at a, at a bulk level, the quiz entirely can be sourced externally uh, by, by, by another user, or it could be a, uh, just to add a question level, I can pick specific questions that I want to uh, kind of Lego piece together to build my own quiz, if you will. Hopefully that makes sense. You'll also notice here that we have uh, enrollment, 
we can we can take a look at which students have enrolled in our course when they enrolled and what their progress is uh, we can uh, we can force enroll students or remove students from the enrollment if you like so managing the student essentially uh, and we also have course reports and with course reports we get kind of analytics about how our students are, are, are uh, you know, how they're progressing through the, the our course, our textbook, if you will. So here we have our student list. Here's when uh, here's when they started reading, right? This is when they hit the enroll button, uh, and this is where they are in terms of their reading. So we can see that this student is in the fundamentals uh, chapter on the Sinusoidal uh, waveforms page in that chapter. We can see that we have two other students. That's when they joined, and this is the object, the course object that they just completed, or the last completed object. We can also do visuals for the instructor, where uh, you know, red for perhaps they're behind the course average or the class average in terms of where they are in their progress of reading, um, and and lots of really kind of interesting different sort of in analytics, uh, if you will, based on uh, how students uh, interact with the course objects. So that's the course overview, but you'll notice that we're gonna, we also have a course objects report. When we go into that section, we'll be able to take a look at each specific object and see what's happening. So the first object that we had was a chapter. It was titled fundamentals. When we click on that, uh, it, the course reports for that object, we'll see that, uh, you know, the list of our students, when they started that object, when they completed that object, if there was any graded elements, the grade for this specific object would be shown here as well. And we'll see that for all of our uh, course objects. Specifically, we'll see it for, uh, or, or probably where it's most useful is in, in, our, in our quizzes, uh, where we get a little bit more advanced uh, kind of uh, statistics, if you will, from uh, our students' uh, interactions with the, with the content. So apart from just an overview and the results, we'll also see uh, charts and graphs automatically generated to dem uh, to essentially let the instructor know, uh, you know, what students are scoring and you know what's the uh, the, the what are the quiz results distribution and uh, things of that nature. Be able to do, at a bird's eye view get a sense of how their students are uh, progressing through the course. Uh, and that essentially was uh, what we have in mind. Right. So uh, again, the courses, the bookshelf, the library, and the quiz bank. A lot of this, probably not right away, but uh, especially the, the, the guaranteed the bookshelf will will come with a certain amount of content, most likely in the language that you want to install uh, solo in. Um, and so there will be at least some uh, a bit of a corpus to to essentially start uh, kickstart your your OER initiatives uh, in that sense. Uh, really quickly, some features that are not in the design, but I, I should probably point out. Uh, instructors will be able to create PDF or design PDF certificates that will get auto automatically generated when the student completes the entire course. So the student completes all of the, the course objects, they pass the course, if you will, uh, an automatic certificate can be generated with the student's name, the course name, et cetera. Uh, that the student will be sent or can download at that point. Uh, we can have course relationships. So of course, because courses can be pre prerequisites uh, for other courses, or they can be linked and chained together in some other ways. Uh, we can, uh, we have a really interesting way of exporting books into static HTML or static sites. So you can think of a book that's been created, we can, uh, we can have that automatically be generated as a static site, a, a lot, uh, very similar to uh, you know, other static site generators such as uh, Jekyll, if you will. Um, and the neat thing is that that provides an option for us to integrate with GitHub to basically push these raw HTML uh, styled, you know, with the CSS, with the JavaScript out into GitHub, into a repository, and then have that repository also, uh, you know, take advantage of things like GitHub pages. So the, the, the actual HTML, the books uh, are, are rendered and, and accessible in that manner on the browser, or we can, you know, the instructor can basically take their content and, uh, you know, run with it at that point um, outside of, outside of uh, uh, solo entirely. 
uh, other things that we're hoping, you know, that this opens up opportunities for student authoring or students to take part in the authoring process. You can imagine a course where uh, the, the, the objective is to, uh, or one of the assignments is to have students create quizzes or H5P elements or, or what have you. You can have that sort of uh, assignment within Solo. Um, obviously, you know, our courses are not LMSs, you know, or, or Solo is not an LMS. Uh, but we do want to integrate with the LMS where, where that's useful. So we might, we're uh, certainly going to have LTI uh, so that the learning experience is a, a, a least a little, or the grading experience at least uh, is, is a bit integrated. Uh, we'll have single sign-on. So your instructors, your students can be able to uh, sign in with their instructional, uh, or sorry, their school credentials. And like we said, it's, it's free open source and uh, something we're really, uh, excited about we will, we will install in 10 15 minutes on a basic uh, you know web server uh, and uh, won't take a whole lot of uh, architecture or expertise to essentially have running um, especially in in, in uh, scenarios where uh, you know uh, that sort of expertise is not really afforded Um, and that's really it in terms of the uh, what we had to what I had to say at least the, about uh, solo and where it's at right now. Great. So um, that was solo, uh, at least the very first uh, public introduction to solo to you guys. Uh, I hope you found it just as interesting as we do, at least in terms of the principle of where it's going. Uh, and uh, uh, we're very excited in order to be able to. Uh, start implementing it. Um, and as part of one of our partnerships, uh, uh, they have one of our partners in Ohio has a desire in order to use this technology uh, within a handful of months uh, uh, for a large uh, use case in uh, Oman. Uh, so we'll already start to get this thing um, beta tested uh, at the same time that it's being written, uh, which is really exciting um, in order to do. So I know I use the word exciting like every fourth word, uh, but it, it really is uh, uh, it, just the, the scope of being able to take the corpus that we've uh, grown and harvested and cultivated and standardized and, like, and make it so that there are multiple avenues in order to access it and, and, and distribute it. And it's just, just really great. So there you go. Again, feel free if you have any questions or concerns uh, or feedback off of that to either contact uh, myself directly or Yassine directly. Um, and uh, I will paste my uh, email address in here and I will let Yassine do the same uh, for his, um, uh, except I can't spell my email address. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Brigitte, uh, just answering that real quick. In terms of uh, student authoring, are there, uh, there any social tools for students? Um, one of the things that I kind of glossed over here uh, was this ability to add discussions into a course. So what our vision for discussions are, you know, the typical discussion where you might have in an LMS, it's very asynchronous, it's, you know, a thread and, and then conversations in it. Uh, but we can also have uh, uh, synchronous um, uh, discussion forums in here. So uh, per, uh, imagine a WhatsApp group-esque looking uh, page, if you will, uh, with a timed release. So you say on March 13th, you know, at this time, log in, we're going to have a discussion, uh, you know, live discussion right in there. Those are the sort of features that uh, we're, 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 we're trying to essentially have. Um, so hopefully that does answer your question. Uh, but in terms of social uh, tools for the students, uh, we are looking at that as well. We discussed the the aspect associated with the content changing languages. Have you started to take a closer look at the um, the the user experience uh, operating in a polyglot manner? I don't know if that's native to Drupal or if that's something that needs to be explicitly uh, wired in. Uh, which specific part? Let's say everything on this page, I want to switch over to Ukrainian. Oh. Um, uh, so is, is there a polyglot option within Drupal or is that something that we have to carefully wire in? No, well, luckily uh, Drupal, because it's such a global uh, initiative, uh, it's already translated in pretty much every language. Um, the, that's the interface at least. Uh, and there is uh, you know, I18N and I11N integration. So 
uh, or implementation, I should say. So we do have the ability to translate the entire interface in, in whichever language. Obviously, that uh, requires effort on our part to actually translate words like H5P library uh, or my quizzes uh, to ensure that you know it's, it's available in the language that it's installed in. But it will be able to, the users will be able to install it in the language that they want and translate it themselves even if they, if they like. And perhaps that that's one way that we can kind of work together with with our organizations to ensure that you know we're, we're uh, we have the entire interface uh, translated in, in their language. Let's say we said something like this. I'm I'm asking myself quite asking us questions because I I'm interested in these things. I'm sorry. Um, uh, are there any complications in terms of running the Drupal technology in a dynamic load leveling? Uh, uh, aspect like Amazon Lambda or so, because if you wanted to be able to run one of these things for a small country uh, instead of just an individual campus, one can imagine that the instantaneous load might be enough in order to start to pull down an, a single server base instance of that. Is that something native or is that something that we have to carefully construct for, for people? Uh, it, it is fairly native. Like uh, okay. we, we, can, we can scale it in, in, in lots of different ways. Okay, great. There are a few questions off of here. Do you want me to answer, uh, respond, write them, read them, or do you want to do so? I can read it here. Another question from from Brigitte. Um, it's a great vision, very impressive. Also answered my other question, but if you want to comment more, this platform lends itself to highly evaluation-driven form of pedagogy. How does that fit in with the open pedagogy principles? Listening to students, giving them agency, making them co-creators. Absolutely. And this is something we try to do in LibreText all the time. Like, uh, we, you know, we, we want students to have not just agency, but to have you know ownership on the the the. A lot of our instructors try to essentially achieve this through our technology, to to for the students to have um, you know to take ownership in the in the learning process. Um, through solo, we're hoping that it's a little bit even extended beyond that, with with students being able to author. Uh, you know, or co-author entire books, H5P quizzes and qu uh, quiz questions uh, to to evaluate the 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 the, uh, the course content and to uh, to have their uh, um, their their presence essentially um, kind of um, I'm not going to say graded. I'm I'm trying to find the right word, uh, but their presence kind of accounted for, if you will. Uh, right here, you'll notice that there's a that there's a number underneath the username two three three zero XP. Um, very kind of slight indication that we're also going to have like a user points based meritocracy kind of caked in, at least a basic one uh, into the application. So as students interact with stuff, as, as they vote things up and comment and and like and bookmark and etc. You know, just like any other kind of social media platform, if you will. Um, they're, uh, you know, the, the, they're they're helping shape uh, the 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 system that they're 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 contributing to, and and that's ultimately uh, the goal. Um, uh, obviously, baby steps as we kind of get there. I, I may mention something on here, and this is part of a conversation that I, I've had in regard to the Adapt Homework system, but I think Drupal is better suited in order to handle that. Um, it, it, the LibreText project was born out of open pedagogy within the uh, the goal of utilizing students uh, as uh, say manual labor of sorts in order to be able to construct uh, books and move it forward. And there are pluses and minuses in order to be able to do that. But certainly from a pedagogical perspective, they're all pluses. Um, one of the things that I've had a, a desire to do is to implement a greater uh, uh, open pedagogy infrastructure in order to be able to uh, have authoring of content and self reviewing of uh, reviewing uh, peer reviewing of the content, and then subsequent cycles through review and edit, edit, review and, and editing in order to be able to make open pedagogy a, a simple uh, a button that someone may want to implement uh, in their class without having to start to formulate the complexities behind doing so. Um, and uh, we've had you know, close to 10,000 plus students uh, engaged in construction efforts of various forms uh, on the LibreText project over the last 14 years. So we have a, a general, actually pretty good idea about what works and what doesn't work as of what best practices we have in order to be able to build this infrastructure. So you can come in and say, I'm going to do this. And these are the approaches, the different approaches you have to, to do. And that is uh, a, a great feature that I've been dreaming about for several 
uh, months, actually. Well, with that, if there are no other questions, I can stop recording. I'll let you guys uh, enjoy the rest of your day and feel...